The title of the book of Proverbs is, uh, in Hebrew, the Mishle Shlomo. Shlomo, whether you've ever realized or not, is the Hebrew version of Solomon. That's what we, uh, that's how they pronounce uh, Solomon's name. Which we translate as the Proverbs of Solomon. But there's a couple of things. Mishle means more than just proverb. Mishle can mean parable, it can mean a saying, it can mean uh, a truth. It has a lot of different meanings in the Hebrew, and um, we call it, we translate it here Proverbs. There are other parts, even in the book of Proverbs, where it, where it is um, translated in different ways. It, it may be translated parable, or saying, or whatever. Elsewhere in Scripture, same thing. And it's also true that while we call it the Proverbs of Solomon, um, the Solomon is not the only author of this book of wisdom literature. Now again, let me talk for a second about the fact that it is wisdom literature. Well, um, tell you what, I think I've got some more detail on that coming up. So, um, yeah, I'll talk about that again in a minute. Um, so the author, Proverbs is actually a collection of collections, or you might consider it an anthology of anthologies. There are several different collections of sayings that happened previous to this book being put together, and then those collections were put together in this form. They're, depending on how you divide it up, and you divide it up several different ways, depending upon where there are superscriptions. Remember, a superscription is a description before a chapter which says either who wrote it or what it's for or what the intention is, etc. Whether you divide it up by superscriptions or by themes or by author, you know, but it's clearly a series of collected works that have all been put together. Tradition holds that Solomon was the author of parts of this book, um, but Proverbs itself, within this book, it tells us that some of the writings were um, to other, not wide men, wise men, <laughs> wide men um, you know, were attributed to other wise men. It particularly mentions uh, Agur and King Lemuel, neither one of whom is ever mentioned anywhere else, so we don't know anything about them. There's some belief that King Lemuel may have been a different uh, not, not, not Jewish. He may have been from a different ancient Near Eastern country. The reason we say that is because part of the writings that are attributed to King Lemuel uh, appear to have been influenced or related to writings that came from Egypt. Um, there are some wisdom, remember, wisdom literature as a type was throughout the entire ancient Near East. Ancient Near East is the historical reference to the Middle East. And if you've been in some of the classes, the reason why we call it the Middle East now, and it used to be called the, you know, the Near East, ancient Near East, is because the reference point used to be Greece. And so from Greece, this is the Near East. Then later, the reference point, from the Western perspective at least, was Rome, or at least Western Europe. And so it started being the Middle East instead of the Near East, because it's further away. It's as simple as that. But when we talk about the countries during the time of ancient Israel, for instance, Egypt, the Hittites, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, all of those folks, we refer to that as the ancient Near East. Within the ancient Near East, there was a strong tradition of wisdom writings. And again, there are passages within the book of Proverbs under the section that's attributed to King Lenuel within Proverbs that appear to have been similar to the, some write, uh, wisdom writings in Egypt. Now. All truth, we don't have a problem with that. All truth is God's truth. Any wisdom, true wisdom that anybody ever has had, finds its source in the wisdom of God. And the fact that somebody in Egypt was inspired to write wise sayings and then they, they ended up being carried over into Israel because they were consistent, that's not a problem. Okay, we don't have difficulty with that. Um, in terms of the date of writing, if we do perceive Solomon as the primary author of Proverbs, then the sections that Solomon wrote would date to the 10th century BC. That's the 900s BC, you know, um, 900 years before Jesus. And that would have been during the United Kingdom. You will remember that Israel was united first under King Saul and then grew to its highest point under King David and his son King Solomon. So this would have been the United Kingdom, the golden period for the the nation of Israel before the divided kingdom, um, and the it makes sense that you don't sit down and the king doesn't have time to sit down and mull on issues of wisdom and write books about how to be a better person if he's concerned about you know military conquest or having enemies that are trying to destroy him or whatever. So the very fact that this book 
is what it is. The nature of the wisdom literature implies that it came during a time that when Solomon the king could write it when he was not pressed by difficult uh, circumstances, as you know, Saul didn't write any wisdom writings, partly because he wasn't very wise. But the other part of it is because he was in a situation, and he, early on, certainly David, that was true. But uh, David still managed to do a lot of writing. But this kind of meditative thought about human life and how we live our lives, etc., it makes sense that this would have occurred during a time of peace and prosperity under King Solomon. Um, other sections, uh, for instance, there's a reference to uh, the sayings of Solomon. There's one section that's the sayings of Solomon. It, it's called the sayings of Solomon as gathered by the men of Hezekiah. Wise men of Hezekiah. So King Hezekiah, which is later, um, sometime between 1715 and 686. So this would be 250 or so years after Solomon. And so, again, this is a collection of collections. We believe that the final gathering together of all of this stuff may have happened even as late as the Babylonian exile. But again, that's just when they gathered it together. We believe it was written probably sometime between. Um, the early 600s and as late, as, as, as old as the time of uh, Solomon in the, the 900s, okay? Now, let's talk a little bit about the, uh, some more details. The recipients were the ancient Jewish people and everybody since. This is the same thing I said about, about the Psalms. Because while the Proverbs were intended specifically for the Jewish people at that time, Everyone since then has benefited. All wisdom is God's wisdom. And the truth that we find in the wisdom literature of Psalms, uh, of Proverbs, of Ecclesiastes, of Job, is still wisdom literature for us today. And that's why it's been handed down to us and why it continues. It's believed that the book of, of Proverbs may have originally been kind of an instruction book for young leaders that were being trained and brought up. Under Solomon, well, under David and under Solomon, the kingdom grew... Uh, amazingly. And as it grew and they took over more provinces, there were more responsibilities to be taken care of. And so they needed, young, they needed leaders. So part of the process was to bring up young leaders, uh, Jewish men especially, who could be administrators, who could take care of what, was needed, what needed to be done as leaders within the kingdom. And the book of Proverbs, there's strong indication because it refers to young people. You know, it talks about my son or my son's and the instruction is teaching morality and ethics and life, um, you know, a good lifestyle to young people, especially so that they would become better leaders. And that's part of the orientation of this book. The themes, again, an excellent example of wisdom literature. It deals with questions of values, of moral behavior, the meaning of human life, and right conduct. A major theme, though, is the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. This isn't just how to act. It's how to act in light of the fact that God is God and we serve Him, right? So it starts with the, the, the premise of God, although it doesn't talk a lot about God. But the understanding is clearly in there because the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom is a theme that recurs throughout this whole book. So God is clearly present, although most of the aspects, of, most of the writing in the Proverbs, they don't, they don't talk about God the way Psalms does. Psalm is a book, Psalms is a book about um, worship of God. Proverbs is a book about wisdom for how to live life. It's like two halves of the coin. All right? Um, and I'm going to show you a thing in a minute. It's sort of like Psalms is about loving God and Proverbs is about loving your neighbor. The first and second commandments Jesus talks about. In other words, how do you act toward other people is what Proverbs is all about. Now in terms of content, there are, as I said, several different ways you can divide this up. There are superscriptions those little introductory lines in Proverbs that divide it into seven sets of sayings, plus an epilogue about the perfect woman. Do we have any single men here? I know. Uh, well, <laughs> we do. Guillermo. Um, the end, the very end of the book of Proverbs, talks about the ideal wife or the ideal woman. Now, the first section, if you, if you divide it by superscriptions, and again, there's a couple of different ways you can divvy it up. Some you will read. Some people say there are six sets, six uh, groupings. Some will say seven. Some even say eight. All right, uh, depending on how they divide that. But the first statement 
um, the first group is Proverbs 1 to 9, and it is, it's identified as Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king in Israel. That's how it starts. And I'm going to give you the first passages here in a few minutes when we look at some of the, some of the verses. The second section starts in chapter 10 and goes through chapter 22, and it's just called, they're just called the Proverbs of Solomon. The third section, Proverbs 22 to 24, uh, 22, it's called the sayings of the wise. That's the superscription. And then the next section, Proverbs 24, verses 23 to 34, is entitled or superscription says, these also are sayings of the wise. Uh, Proverbs 25 to 29, uh, chapters 25 to 29, are titled or the superscription is, these are other Proverbs of Solomon that the officials of King Hezekiah of Judy, Judah copied. Now, um, let me say something here. It just occurred to me. When I preached on Sunday um, about the Psalms, and I preached on the second Psalm, and I mentioned the previous time I preached in, in Sunday, that the first two Psalms don't have any superscriptions. There's no introduction or anything. And there's sort of a, a general introduction to all of the book of Psalms. Somebody wrote me an email and said, well, that's not true in my Bible. My, my Bible has uh, captions. Well, the captions that they were talking about were added by the editors just as a study aid. You know, it, there were little, like, six or seven word things that say, this is what this chapter is about. That's not in the original text. That was added by editors later. So when you look at your Bibles, from time to time, you may see captions that don't look like this, but that's something that the, the Bible publishers put in that may just describe, here's what this chapter is. This is what this is about. These are superscriptions that are in the original Hebrew. So that was put in there by either the original writers or some editors in ancient times to give us an indication. Okay, I just want to make that clear because this person was really confused. You said there were no captions. There are in mine. Okay. Isn't that also true of chapters and verses? Exactly. Yeah, you know, there, there were no chapters in the original. There were no verses in the original. Um, when Paul wrote his letters or John or Peter or you know Isaiah or anybody else, they didn't break it up into chapters and verses. In fact, if you read the original Greek, they don't even break it up into words. Greek is a constant stream of Greek consonants with no breaks. You had to know the language, and most of them were capital letters. You know, they do have, they're called unse unseals. And most of the most ancient manuscripts we have of the Greek New Testament um, are all unseals. They're all capital letters, and it's one constant stream of capital letters in Greek. All consonants, no vowels. And so that's one of the reasons you have to study this stuff, is to be able to know what it says, to know where Greek words start and end, and how all of that works out. Okay? They had a very different way of writing in ancient times. I didn't get eaten a lot by mosquitoes. I'm scratching. Sorry. Um, I, if there's a bug in the room, I'll find it. <laughs> so um, that's Proverbs 25 to 29. And then Proverbs 30 are the words of Agor. Uh, again, we don't know who Agor is. He's a wisdom writer. He is not referred to anywhere else in Scripture. We have no other reference. And then, Proverbs 31, 1 to 9, the words of King Lemuel of, Ma of Massa. We don't know anything about King Lemuel either, other than the fact that he, we don't think he was Jewish. We believe this is the section that has some statements, some, some passages that apparently come from the ancient Egyptian uh, wisdom writings. And then, I mentioned earlier, uh, the last part, and this is sort of under the, the words of King Lemuel of Massa, which is why I call it an epilogue. There is, a, there is a little section at the end of Proverbs, the 31st chapter, which is called the wife of noble character. You know, she keeps the household, raises the kids, runs a business, makes money, you know, uh, <laughs> brings home the bacon, fries it up in a pan. I mean, you name it. This is the description of the ideal wife, the, the noble woman. There's a couple of different names for her. That's kind of a, a, an epilogue. It's interesting that was tagged on at the end. But these are, this is one way you can look at the sections of Proverbs, and it sort of gives you an idea what all is going on here. Um, another way that you can look at dividing this up is this way. This, you'll notice, has six sections because um, I, they've got the words of Lemuel, here, good woman is one section of that, but they've identified, you know, sort of uh, what what kind of writings are here, and then these are the 
the kind of uh, set breakdown. The purpose of Proverbs um, in the prologue, which we will look at in a second, the appeal to wisdom, which is uh, to wisdom personified. Now, one of the things that Proverbs does is it personifies wisdom. It also personifies folly. We'll talk about that a little bit. As a way of emphasizing that we should seek, we should follow wisdom, don't follow folly. Both of them are personified as women, by the way. Then we have the Proverbs of Solomon and the Proverbs of Hezekiah. It's actually called the Proverbs of Solomon as, as collected by um, the people of Hezekiah or the, the uh, court of Hezekiah. And those are mostly one verse maxims. Those are usually, that's what we usually think of as a proverb. We'll talk about the forms in a minute. We think of a proverb as being a, an aphorism, um, a one line kind of statement of truth. Um, the, the modern king of, of aphorisms is um, my hero, one of my heroes, G.K. Chesterton. Um, Chesterton had all these beautiful one-liners. Things like, um, this is an example of an aphorism. Christianity has not been tried and found wanting. It has been found difficult and not tried. You know, a great truth captured in one sentence. Um, he said angels can fly because they take themselves lightly. <laughs> a lot of his stuff is also humorous. But that, that's a proverb, an aphorism, a one-liner. And so the middle section here, um, chapters 10 to 30, are almost all these sort of one-liners. That's one of the reasons it makes it hard to study Proverbs, is because the largest part of it are these one-liners that keep coming at you. And it's almost like you need to take one of them and meditate on it. Uh, Proverbs is often used for devotionals. It's very seldom preached on and very seldom taught. The reason being because in terms of any content kind of thing, you courses on, whole courses on Proverbs would be very difficult because how do you teach one-liners? Okay. Uh, unless you're a comedy school, maybe. Um, and then, there, but there are other kinds. There are larger couplets where there are two lines. And here, it gets into some of the Hebrew poetry that we talked about, like the parallelism, where there's a statement that is then reinforced, or there's a statement and then the counter is given, or there's a statement and then it's expanded on. Those are the kind of couplets. And then, um, again, we end up with a statement about the good woman or the, the noble wife, all right? Any questions about any of that? Yes? Um, I'm just curious. These were all on different scrolls that someone compiled? Well, it, they would have, as I say, it's a collection of collections. Each of these probably, each of these sections probably was completely separate at one point. And they were... And some of them even say, for instance, the Proverbs of Hezekiah, they say this is a collection of the sayings of Solomon. And then those collections were then collected together, probably sometime in the 6th or 7th century BC. Um, but the, the larger number of them are attributed to Solomon. Um, that's why it, the first passage, when it's the, the purpose of the Proverbs, starts out by saying these are the Proverbs of Solomon. Um, I know God's behind all this, but would it be that uh, uh, the men of the Jewish faith were the ones that gathered all this and put it together? Yes, yeah, there would have been Jewish scholars that put all of this together. Now, again, we believe that at least Lemuel, we don't know about Agur, we believe that Lemuel likely was not Jewish because of the fact that some of his materials we can identify as having come from other sources, not, not from within it, um, Jewish tradition. Now, again, all truth is God's truth. If God inspired some Egyptian writer to write this and then God also, you know, um, motivated that to be transferred to somewhere else, and King Lemuel quoted this stuff, whoever King Lemuel was. And then this got picked up by Jewish scholars to add into the book of Proverbs. All of that, we believe, is part of God's providential will. So we don't have a problem with that. Now, if it, if it, if this, if it advocated that um, one of the Egyptian gods was the true God, you know, if it talked about Ra being the one true God, then we'd have a problem with it. But there's nothing in this that is inconsistent with the rest of the Jewish literature, okay? Okay. I mean, we do we do the same thing all the time, where we compile we compile different short essays or articles of different Christian leaders of our time period, and we don't ascribe to them as being inspirational as far as inspired by the Holy Spirit of Scripture, but we do the very same thing. Yeah, and there's value to be found in it. Uh, Okay, um, let's, I think it's helpful to look at a comparison between Psalms and Proverbs. I suggested this earlier. 
Um, whereas Psalms is a book of worship. It's about God. The whole reference is God and how we can worship Him, relate to Him. The book of Proverbs is a book of wisdom about how to live life. Whereas Psalms speaks to our spirit, Proverbs really speaks to our intellect. They're instructions on how to live. And so you have to listen to it and think about it and try to apply it rather than feel it as much. Okay? Um, Psalms is about a life in prayer. Proverbs is about life out in the street. How do you act? Not what is your spiritual life about, but how do you act? Now these two are really two sides of the same coin. It's not that one is better than the other. They certainly don't contradict each other. They are just two different aspects of, you know, we are, we've said before that human beings, as C.S. Lewis said, are amphibians. We are spiritual beings in a physical body. Psalms is about what we do with our spiritual being. Proverbs is about what we do with our physical body. You know, I mean, how we act, how we relate to people in the physical world. Um, Psalms teaches us how to be holy before God. Proverbs teaches us how to practice that holiness before men. And again, Psalms does not exclude God. God is an important theme in, in I'm sorry, Proverbs. doesn't exclude God. God is an important theme in Proverbs. But much of it is a direct, a direct address to especially young men as to how they're supposed to act. Um, and as, as I said earlier, you might view Psalms as being the first commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And the Proverbs is the second. Love your neighbor as yourself. How do you then act in the world toward others? Okay, that gives you... Psalm and Pro, and Psalms and Proverbs are often seen joined. It's not uncommon, for instance, uh, to get, and I, I don't particularly like this, but I understand sometimes the need for it. You can get a New Testament, and often if you just get a New Testament, not a whole Bible, the New Testament, they'll include Psalms and Proverbs. At least Psalms, but often it's Psalms and Proverbs. Because Psalms and Proverbs have always been seen as complementary to one another in terms of spiritual and practical and how we, how we live our lives, okay? Now, um, this, this passage, whoops, is the introduction. This is how Proverbs starts. And it gives you, this is the prologue that tells you what the book, I keep saying Psalm, sorry, that Proverbs is uh, about. This tells you where this book is going. Now, it's believed that this first part, the Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, the king of Israel, may have been added later. Now, we do believe that Solomon was responsible for a large part of the book of, of Proverbs. But it, it's, it's thought that this might have been put at the front end of it in order to make, it, make people take it more seriously. You know, because Solomon was the king, you know, the great wise king, not so much at the end of his life, but you know, known for his wisdom, known for his writings. In fact, in 1 Kings chapter 4, I think it is, they, I, they credit Solomon with having written over 3,000 proverbs, expressions of his wisdom. Okay, so he was well known as a writer of proverbs. And so the idea is this may have been added by scholars later. And it, you know, it doesn't give anything away because we believe Solomon did. But this actual little statement may have been added. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, for attaining wisdom and discipline. There's the wisdom literature. For understanding words of insight. For acquiring a disciplined and prudent life. Doing what is right and just and fair. For giving prudence to the simple. Knowledge and discretion to the young. There's the young Young, young man training. Let the wise listen and add to their learning and let the discerning get guidance. For understanding proverbs and parables, the sayings and riddles of the wise. And here's that theme. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. That actually is that antithetical parallelism. The positive. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The negative parallel statement. But fools despise wisdom and discipline. This is what the book of Proverbs is all about. Okay? Um, questions about any of that? Okay. Um, let's talk about some of the literary forms in Proverbs because by doing this, I think it helps us to understand where Proverbs is going. What, you know, what's it doing? What's it saying? I'm going to give you some examples uh, as we go along. The, the first most obvious literary form in Proverbs are instructions. They are sort of extended admonitions, usually addressed to my son or my sons. Here's where we get the idea that this was used to uh, train young men so that they would be suited for leadership. 
how they should live their lives, on ethical conduct, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so there are sections, large sections, that are purely instructions. There are some that are longer. That you know, they, they, at the extended admonitions of instructions tend to be fairly short still. Then there are wisdom speeches, which tend to be a little bit longer. They're poems of several verses that personify wisdom and folly. Wisdom is seen, as I say, as a woman. And all of the beauty of a woman and the, you know, the grace and all of the good parts about wisdom and why we should follow that. And then folly is also seen as a woman, particularly an unsavory woman, you know, um, a prostitute particularly, um, and why we shouldn't go that direction. Then there are simply proverbs. Those are short aphorisms which make a moral or ethical point. And I want to talk about several kinds of um, proverbs because there's different ones of those. First, there are simply sayings. They, are, they give description of how wisdom or folly work, and they are indicative rather than imperative. In other words, they're not giving an order. They're just observing something. For example, Proverbs 3.35, the wise shall inherit glory, and here's that parallelism, but, the antithetical parallelism, the opposite, but shame shall be the legacy of fools. There's no command in that. It's not saying you, have to, you should do this or you have to do this. It's simply observing a reality about wisdom and foolishness. The wise shall inherit glory, but shame shall be the legacy of fools. That's one of the parable or the uh, par proverb sayings. Then we have admonitions, which differ because they actually give an imperative command. They say, do this, with either positive or negative consequences. Do this, and this good thing will happen, or do this, and if you don't, this negative thing will happen. An example would be Proverbs 3, 1b-2, but let your heart keep my commands. That's, that's an imperative, that's an instruction, do this. For length of days and long life and peace they will add to you. Here's the benefit. Here's the positive. So admonitions, giving of a command with consequences uh, delineated in this. Okay? And you guys are going to stop me from getting questions about this, but you're good. You get where we're going with this so far, right? Then we have something that people always wonder and question. Um, it's numerical sayings. These probably originally derived in ancient Hebrew uh, word games or riddles. And they usually follow an X, X plus one pattern. Things like Proverbs 30, 18, there are three things which are too wonderful for me. Yes, four things I do not understand. Now that sounds really silly to us, but this is a poetic way for, for Hebrew writers to emphasize the point, you know. Um, you notice that, and it's to make you know to make a, a, an important point. Usually, it would go it'll go on, and it'll say here's and here's what those four things are. It'll say there are five things that God desires. Yes, six that He requires of us. So x x plus one, and it's just like I say, it's it's probably originated in kind of riddle games, but these numerical sayings occur in a number of places throughout the Proverbs just for emphasis, just to get people's attention, just to make them pay attention to it. Then we have rhetorical questions that force the student toward the right answer by asking a question that the answer is obvious. That's what rhetorical means. Um, can, and here's an example, Proverbs 6, 27. Can a man take fire to his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Duh. And this has to do, we see that it's making a point about morality. You think you can sleep with a prostitute and not suffer consequences of some kind? Well, they do it poetically by a rhetorical question. Can a man take fire to his bosom and his clothes not be burned? And that makes it, gives a vivid illustration of the point they're trying to make, is there are consequences to things. Don't assume you can do something dangerous or stupid and not suffer for it, not have the consequences. And so they ask rhetorical questions with obvious answers. Okay. See a question on a face? Anybody have any questions about that or comments? I think you can see just from these examples the poetry that's involved. As I, I mentioned the poetry of, of Psalms, but Proverbs as well has a lot of this Hebrew poetry, either antithetical or uh, parallel, um, positive parallel construction or you know, expanding on points. There's a lot of different ways in which this is all done. All of it 
The, the difference being in Psalms, it's all toward having us understand and worship God. In Proverbs, it's to try to teach us practical lessons about how to live. Now, continuing with that. Can I oh, ask a question? Sure. Um, this is one of the things that I find a little difficult about the Bible. When you read that, can a man take fire to his bosom and his clothes not burnt, be burned, you said that was about if you slept with a prostitute that there would be consequences. How would I know that without you telling me? Well, oftentimes this will be in that context. He'll go on to talk about the folly of a, you know, a loose woman kind of thing. Okay. But, however, whatever this applies to, I mean, this could, this could apply to if I went out and spent all my money, then I'm not going to have any to buy food. In other words, think about this stuff. Okay. If you do certain things, there are going to be consequences, and you need to pay attention to what the consequences are. And he uses a rhetorical question, an obvious example, to make us stop and think. Okay, um, can a man take fire to his wisdom and his clothes not be burned? I mean, obviously not. You don't hold a, you know, hold a flame up against your own chest and not expect your clothes to catch on fire. And so it's just making a point that pay attention. There are consequences to actions. Pay attention to that. Marvin. I'm getting the sense that knowledge is one thing, but wisdom is a level harder to obtain. Mm -hmm. And you all can read these and say, yeah, that's right, yeah, that's right, and then it, it pushes you to get the, get the answer. We have to uh, do the right application of the knowledge and actually do it in order to have wisdom. Otherwise, it doesn't mean anything. Yeah. We can read through this and, oh, that's nice, that's good. If we don't do it, I, mean, I think they're just trying to get people to, to do it, to apply it, and, and be wise. And you're exactly right. And the only way that this, that this will be wisdom to us is if we think, like in that case, using Proverbs 6.27, to ask yourself the question, what am I doing that's just like that? Okay. If I, if I decided I was going to sleep till 11 o'clock every day and then, you know, I'm not getting the work done I need to get done during the day, well, duh, there's consequences to that. Um, if, if I, like I say, if I decide I'm going to go out and spend $20,000 on this, you know, 100-inch flat screen, when I know that I've got, you know, that I owe money to blah, blah, I'm not going to be able to pay that. There are consequences to the actions I take. And so wisdom means not just reading this stuff and going, oh, yeah, well, that's true. But rather saying, how does that apply to me? What does that do with me, have to do with me? And they're very practical. I mean, this... This one, um, you know, taking a fire to the bosom is sort of a general rhetorical question, but there are many of them that we, that when he talks about not following a, you know, a loose woman, <laughs> duh, very practical, okay, um, about being generous, we'll look at that too, about giving to people who are in need, and things like very, very practical, many of them, Ken? Oh, I just laughed, I read, you know, when you, you read about these things, you think of things that happen in modern day life. I, a few days ago I got this message that said we learn in three ways. We learn by, we can either learn by listening to men, by reading books, or, or by being on the electric fence. Mm -hmm. oh. You know, and that, a lot of that is exactly what the Proverbs go through. It's if you, you know, you can listen, you can read, you can gain that wisdom, or you can go out and have a terrible experience. Exactly. And we're going to, the reflection on experience is is coming up here in terms of sharing what my experience was. You know, let me tell you what happened when I get on electric fence. Okay. Um, so that you don't have to. Um, so let's look at some more of these. And for some reason, this one all came out at once, even though I told it to come up one at a time. Let's still look at it. First, there is a call. There are calls to attention. In other words, pay attention. That's what the proverb is. Like, my son, pay attention to my wisdom. Lend your ear to my understanding. That's Proverbs 5.1. There are places in here where it goes, okay, write this one down. This is important. Pay attention to this. There are other places where there are reflections on experience, where a teacher is sharing their experience with a student or with you know, whoever, whoever is paying attention. Again, I say teacher to student because the idea here is this is wisdom passed on from older to younger. Proverbs 4, starting with verse 3, For I too was a son to my father, still tender and cherished by my mother. In other words, the, the, the uh, reflection on experience. Let me tell you about when I was your age. 
Then he taught me, and he said to me, take hold of my words with all your heart. Keep my commandments, uh, my commands, and you will live. Get wisdom, get understanding. Do not forget my words or turn away from them. And it goes on from there in more detail. But it's a way of saying, let me share my experience with you. Okay? Um, I may not be king on electric fence, but the idea is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you out here so you can learn from my experience so that you don't have to suffer the consequences of doing something wrong when you can know in advance that's a bad idea. Then there's an account of personal observation, which is another, another form of the argument from experience. But it has to do with what, you've, what the teacher, what the, the old or the wise man has seen. An example would be Proverbs 7. At the window of my house, I looked down through the lattice. I saw among the simple, I noticed among the young men, a youth who had no sense. And there's a couple more comments about how dumb he is. Then it says, then out came a woman to meet him, dressed like a prostitute and with crafty intent. <laughs> dot, dot, dot. You can sort of know where that's going. Right? This is an example of, let me tell you what I observed. This is what young men tend to do, and this is the consequence of that. So, an account of personal observation, which is a, ver a version of experience. Then there are Beatitudes within the Proverbs, which are promises or exclamations of happiness. Beatitudes we know uh, from Matthew are the blessed, you know, you know the, 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 the blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth, etc. In this case, blessed or happy is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding. That's Proverbs 3.13. There are a number of these sort of Beatitudes, which means Beatitude means blessed. Um, we just went through the process, uh, the Catholic Church just went through the process of uh, making saints out of uh, Pope John the Twenty-Third and Pope John Paul the Second. Well, before they became saints, they were beatified, which means they were identified as being blessed, or blessed. That they, uh, and some, some who are beatified never do end up becoming saints, because after they were beatified, recognized as being people of extraordinary character, they then had to go through a process of identifying some supernatural or miraculous events associated with them, miracles that were attributed to prayer, prayer to them or whatever, before they actually became saints. But that idea of being blessed, of being, uh, that's beatified, uh, that's where we get beatitude, all right? And then finally, allegory or extended metaphor. Usually this is with some sort of natural imagery, and especially of water. There are a lot of references to fountains and rivers and waterfalls, and in this case, Proverbs 5.15, uh, cistern, drink water from your own cistern, running water from your own well. The idea of being, you know, uh, learn from your own experience. Pay attention to what's going on in your own life, and you'll learn from that. Okay. Uh, any questions about any of that? Again, it is very hard to teach Proverbs because of the fact that so much of it is one-liners. You know, how do you teach one-liners? That's why I've tried to do is to give you some kind of group of them and give you some idea what some of those things are. Um, let's see if there's anything else in here that I want to. Uh, the one thing that I would mention is, whereas the Psalms, which are writings of worship to God, are much are very Jewish. You know, they're completely Jewish in terms of the writings of David, the, who wrote most of the Psalms. They, they reflect a Jewish character, a Jewish relationship with God. There are aspects of the, the Proverbs which actually begin to deal with more, more similar, at least, to Greek thought. Because they deal with values, um, they deal with actions, moralities. Now, um, the, the Greeks were very big into inquiry, into values, and reflection on the human condition, you know, what's going on with us. Um, they would, that's why Greek philosophy, all the different Greek philosophies were basically different ways of explaining the human condition and how you're supposed to act. Stoicism, you know, um, uh, and all the others, all the different Greek philosophical systems, and there were many of them, were all observations about the human condition and how you're supposed to act. And in that way, Proverbs is more similar to Greek thought in some ways than it is to other aspects of Hebrew thought. However, there is a very practical, um, you know, that Proverbs ends with very practical recommendations and directions, whereas Greek philosophy tended to recognize human condition and make recommendations, but then they went off into 
ontology and epistemology and metaphysics, etc. In other words, they, they get very cerebral in, in the Greek philosophy, and Proverbs stays very practical. Okay, it doesn't go there. There is no ontology is a, is a, a uh, meditation on the nature of being. Epistemology is a, is a the study of how can we know anything. Uh, metaphysics are the questions like, is there a God? What is the purpose of human life? Proverbs, in fact, no Hebrew writing goes into any of that. All of that is assumed by, by the existence of God and us made in the image of God. But there are ways in which I think it's useful for us to understand that Proverbs is more Greek uh, than most of the Hebrew writing and that it does deal with the human condition and what to do about it in some ways. Um, most of the Proverbs are very simplistic. Okay? There's not a lot of subtlety in this stuff. Don't chase bad women. Okay, there's not a lot of subtlety in that. You know, the issue isn't, well, how do you feel about this woman? You know? It's very, very cut and dry. There's not a lot of gray in, in the Proverbs. Do this, don't do that. If you do this, here are the consequences, good or bad. If you don't do that, here are the consequences, good or bad. So it's, it's very cut and dry. It's a very almost simplistic view of human life. But you need that sometimes. You know, there are aspects of life in which we, we, we s try to add all this subtlety in ways that are so destructive. Well, yes, I know I'm married, but I really love her. I don't care. You made a commitment to somebody else. That's, that, it's not okay. You get over it. Right? That's what Proverbs would say. So it doesn't deal with those subtleties. It deals with very practical, kind of matter-of-fact sorts of stuff. Um, and, and in that way, is very, very valuable to us because it forces us to recognize there is a right and there's a wrong. There's a good, there's a bad. There's true and there's untrue. There's black and there's white. And yes, there, there are, you know, you do get into certain circumstances in your life when there, there are subtleties that you have to be aware of. But we're too quick to want to create subtle is when sometimes it truly is black and white. You know, there is right and there is wrong. There's not always, there doesn't always need to be an argument about that. And Proverbs makes those points. Yes? Can I ask you, would this mostly be written uh, by men for men? Yes. Um, which was true for all ancient literature. Um, women would have tended not to be. Now, Jewish women were not part of the formal school system, but they would tend, more Jewish women would be able to read than probably uh, non-Jewish women. But still, it was, this was, that's why so many of these things are to my son or to my sons. And it was the idea of raising up men, young men, to be in leadership positions. So that's true. The principles behind it are valid for both sexes, I believe. I mean, whenever it says, don't follow loose women because it was written for young men. It's just as applicable to say to women, don't follow men who are trying to get you to do things you shouldn't do. So the truths are still there. But yes, as with almost all ancient writing, it would have been by men for men. That's accurate. Yes? So then how did the ancient women learn all of this? They didn't. They weren't taught this. So they would learn through observing their parents? And no, they would do what they were told by their father or by their husband. Okay. It was a patriarchal world. So this would, the issue wasn't. Um, there are rare exceptions to that. Um, I mean, there are some significant women in ancient times that were philosophers, and, you know, um, one of the most important women philosophers who was also a medical doctor and everything else ended up being torn apart by a crowd because they didn't like the fact that she was ugly. Okay. So that that's she was she was a uh, Egyptian. But the fact is that this is not the sort of thing that would be given to women or they'd be expected to learn because it was a patriarchal society. Okay. Now, modern times, it would be. I mean, uh, women would study this, women would learn this, this you know, the, the truths of this would be accessible to women. But when it was originally written, no, it would have been Yes. Does that not make, going back to your just previous statement of where it was written for men um, who were able to read and um, were going to be leaders in the society, does that not make it that much more important for the women because if we don't educate our sons 
and uh, follow our husbands who are supposedly well-educated and well-informed, then our society starts to crumble uh, around the edges. So we are um, raising strong leaders from the time of infanthood, yeah, whether I, they are meant to be leaders or just head of households. Right. I think that's very true today. Um, again, the question was in ancient times. In ancient times, women would not have been involved in Women would nurture the children, men would train them. I mean, that was the division. Women would nurture, they would provide the food, they would provide the comfort, they would provide, you know, take care of the household. I, I'm not advocating this, I'm just saying historically that was true. Uh, and, but, and men would be responsible for teaching, teaching them to grow up and to, to be good men. Okay, that was the division of labor in, in, those, in those times. Okay? It, just, it just seems like um, that there's just Contest because at the end they talk about the noble woman. Okay, well that's wonderful, but if she didn't know how all of this, how could she be that? Well, um, yeah, and then, I mean that's a good point. There, there were. On the one <laughs> hand, they would not make the effort to train women in these sorts of things, but on the other hand, they would. They proverbs honors a woman who is that way. In fact, let's look at that real quick. Since we're talking about this. Um, whatever your translation is, if you want to go to the end of Proverbs, it's Proverbs 31. And I can remember when I was, you know, when I was like a high school student and I was a junior counselor in a Bible camp, um, all the guys would read this and say, that's the kind of woman I want. <laughs> okay. um, it starts in chapter 31, verse 10. I'm just going to read it. A woman of noble character, who can find? She is worth far more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. She selects wool and flax and works with eager hands. She is like the merchant ships, bringing her food from afar. She gets up while it is still night. She provides food for her family and portions for her female servants. See, there is that whole, you know, providing the food in the household and all that thing. She considers a field and buys it. Out of her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for her tasks. She sees that her trading is profitable and her lamp does not go out at night. In her hand, she holds the distaff and grasps the spindle with her fingers. That's spinning, spinning wool. She opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. When it snows, she has no fear for her household, for all of them are clothed in scarlet. She makes coverings for her bed. She is clothed in fine linen and purple. Purple was very expensive. Okay. It actually was many times a sign of royalty because purple, the color purple was made from the crushed shells of a very small um, mollusk and very expensive to do. That's why usually only royalty can afford it. If she's wearing purple, she's very successful. Okay. Um, her husband is respected at the city gate where he takes his seat among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies the merchants with sashes. She is clothed with, clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tongue. She watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her, husband, her children arise and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. There's that fear of the Lord theme again, which, which Proverbs started with. Honor her for all that her hands have done and let her works bring her praise at the city gate. So, while it's true that this was a patriarchal society where women were not usually educated in things like what we're reading in Proverbs, there's still... Uh, you need to recognize that the Jews were quite enlightened in terms of the fact that they did honor women who achieved and, and who were noble of character, etc. Um, sounds a little unfair, but it's, you know, the fact that they were open to that at all and that we have that record you know, of a description of a woman like that is a positive thing. There are not many references to women at all in the ancient literature. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Is it not, it's just come to me with not reading it, but hearing a bit, that is again the two sides of the coin. The men are teaching the the way, and the women are showing the way. Mm -hmm. That practical application right. of what you've, you've learned. You can read all this and have it all here, but if you don't use it, then 
you're not the person that's going to be honored and praised. Right. Exactly. And women were responsible for nurturing. You don't nurture without having some communicating some values. Okay. The, the men might be the ones that talk about it and take the kids out, you know, the, and teach them. Here's how you act, you know, here's how you do this, you know, all the practical application, but unless the mothers were aware enough of this to be able to, to inculcate it in their children as they nurtured them, then it would be out. Marvin. When she sees the field and buys it with her own money, she's hardly a, a woman under somebody's thumb. Exactly. She doesn't say that she consulted with her husband and he gave her permission or he gave her the money. She it says she did it from her own savings. She's, she's a pretty liberated woman. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yes, Pam. Uh, I don't know where you are if you're a woman that can't bear children. Yeah. Um, That's you, because you're a whole part of your... You mean in ancient times? Yes. Well, actually the Hebrews believed that children were a gift of God and the inability to bear children was a curse. That, that you somehow were not... You somehow offended God or you were not in God's favor. And we have examples of that. Uh, Hannah, you know, the mother of Samuel, for instance, is one that comes to mind, where... She would go to the temple and pray to God. In fact, she would she would pray and she'd be moving her mouth, and the, the priest at uh, the temple thought she was drunk. And then she was just, and she goes, "No, I haven't been drinking." He says, "Woman, go home and stop drinking." And she says, "No, I'm not drinking. I'm, I'm without child, and I'm praying for a child." And he says, "Well, I'll pray for you too." And well, she has a son, Samuel, and in gratitude, she has other children later, apparently. But in gratitude, she dedicates Samuel to work in the temple, and he becomes. One of the truly great, you know, characters of the Old Testament, um, both both priest and prophet, and um, but she she was seen as cursed. She saw herself as cursed. She was seen by others as cursed. And her her husband apparently tried to make it better for her, but uh, that's that's that was common in those days. Didn't have children, so okay. It's almost eleven. Let's take a break. We will come. Okay, um, let's talk about the outline of the book of Proverbs. I've already shared with you the purpose and theme, which is the first seven verses, um, which talks about the fact that this is to teach wisdom, to give understanding, and that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It then goes into a superior way of wisdom. Uh, it talks about appeals and warnings confronting youth. And remember, much of this has to do with, most of this has to do with young people, especially young men. It talks about two areas of uh, concern, sort of the uh, first there are the enticements to use violence. The, it says, you young men, you're going to have gangs, you're going to have other young men who are going to tell you that to get what you want, you just take it, because you're stronger. Don't do that. That's a bad idea. And it also warns against rejecting wisdom and being tempted to follow after bad women to do things of that sort. And so they're talking about two different ways in which youth have a problem. One, they're enticed by their fellows. The other is they're enticed by desires in the world. Okay. Um, there then is the commendation of wisdom, and this is where wisdom begins to be uh, really personified. The benefits of wisdom's instructions, you'll notice wisdom is instructing. Wisdom is personified in this regard. How wisdom bestows well-being, how wisdom uh, gives instructions that are positive and has, have benefits. And then there's the challenge to hold on to wisdom. Yeah. Get wisdom. Get understanding. That theme comes over and over and over again. Then we flip the coin and we have the opposite side, the warnings against folly. Both of these are personified. Get wisdom. Stay away from folly. There's warning against adultery being tempted by uh, the prostitutes, loose women. There are warnings against other perverse ways. There is the cost of committing adultery. There's a warning about the practical, you know, this is back to that sort of, if you hold a, a fire up against your chest, you expect that your clothes aren't gonna get burned. There's gonna be a consequence to this. And then specifically the warnings against an adulterous woman. Um, we go on then to additional appeals addressed to the youth, the call of wisdom to young people, the invitation of wisdom, and a folly. Both of these are trying to pull you in. Wisdom wants you to follow her ways. Folly wants you to follow her ways. There is a divergent path. You are responsible for picking the right way. And that's all addressed to youth, especially young men. 
We then have the main collection of Solomon's Proverbs, most of which are these aphorisms. They're kind of one-liners. Then we have 30 sayings of the wise. You saw, you saw the outline. You know, these are the sayings of the wise. And then these are more sayings of the wise. <laughs> um, then we have Hezekiah's collections of Solomon's Proverbs, collected by the noblemen of Hezekiah's time. The sayings of Agur, or Agur, I'm not sure how you pronounce that. The sayings of King Lemuel, and then the epilogue, the wife of noble character that we just read. This is the whole book of Proverbs. Um, and all of the different forms that we talked about. Much of it, like from chapter 10 to chapter 30, almost all of that constitutes, for the most part, one-liners or two-liners. You know, very short kind of statements that don't, it doesn't build an argument. They're just, you know, these, the, the truths that hit you from this stuff. Um, from a devotional point of view, I recommend to people that when you study the book of Proverbs, when you read the book of Proverbs, you read and pay attention to what it's, it says and say, how does this apply to me? And when you hit one that strikes home, stop. Because the point of reading these Proverbs, especially the short ones, not the longer wisdom sort of uh, expositions, but the short, punchy ones, is when you get one that you go, wow, that's something I really need to hear. Spend some time thinking about that, meditating on it, praying about it. You don't benefit from having a hundred of these things that have just run past your eyes, you know, uh, while you're sitting there. So, but they're very valuable. They're not, again, the book of Proverbs doesn't get nearly as much credit as it should in terms of preaching or, or um, teaching, that sort of focus. But from the devotional point of view, it can be very, very powerful. Some of the things I do in this in this instituto are not really very academic. They're much more sort of pastoral. But um, I realize that every once in a while I catch myself on that. Some of the themes in Proverbs, the way of wisdom we've talked about, the principles of work is another one. It talks about skilled work will lead to success, diligent work will lead to success. Um, the way of the sluggard is as a hedge of thorns, but the path of the upright is a highway. There you get the antithetical parallelism. This but the opposite. If you uh, are a slugger, it's a hedge of thorns. If you are upright and you work hard, then it's a highway. The difference between being stopped by a thorny hedge or being able to move you know, freely. Go to the ant, O slugger, observe her ways and be wise, which having no chief, officer, or ruler, prepares her food in the summer and gathers her provisions in the harvest. You know, the proverb of the ant. They work constantly. And they don't starve to death when winter comes because of that. Because when it's not winter, they, of course, we have leaf cutter rats. And, you know, they just start to <laughs> around. Yeah. Um, but, astonishing, astonishing. But, you know, the idea that the ants work, they collect, they, you know, they, it's not like, um, I remember some Disney things where they took like the ant and then there was the, the ant, the image of the ant who just sort of sat back and put his feet up, you know, and then was hungry in the wintertime. So that's from Proverbs. All of that is from the, from the Proverbs. We then get into principles of generosity, of business, and of finance. Um, do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is in your power to do it. Do not say to your neighbor, go and come back and tomorrow I will give it when you have it with you. And also, he who trusts in his riches will fall, but the righteous will flourish like the green leaf. Again, a statement, and then the opposite. Antithetical parallelism. You trust in his riches will fall, but the righteous will flourish like a green leaf. Um, so this gets very, very practical uh, as well. Principles of uh, spiritual speech, Proverbs 26.20. For lack of wood, the fire goes out. Well, where there is a whisperer, contention quiets down. Um, the idea being that if you don't have wood, you don't have a fire. If you're not talking, you're not going to create a problem. So shut up. Okay. Um, very, very practical kinds of instruction on some of this stuff. Lessons from the Proverbs. Um, and this is actually my last slide, so you're going to get out a little bit early today. Here's just a few of the things that I think the book of Proverbs kind of summing it up. One, the universal need for wisdom. We all need to seek wisdom. Get wisdom. Get understanding. And where does wisdom begin? With the fear of the Lord. 
So that's the foundation. The universal arena of wisdom. Wisdom affects everything. The idea of applying the truths of God in how we live our lives touches everything. And we need to recognize that. That we can either be wise or foolish in anything and everything we do. I can be a bonehead about anything. Or I can be wise as my seeking after God directs me to the wise action. Um, what is wise is also what is good, always. If you want to know what wisdom looks like, it is what is good. There is good, there is bad. There is right, there is wrong, there is true, there is untrue. There is black and there is white. Granted, sometimes we have to make decisions and it looks great. But more often than not, there is a right and a wrong. And what is right, what is good, what is true, is that which is wise. If you want to know what that looks like. And in the book of Proverbs, there are principles rather than promises. Principles of here's how you act. Here's what wisdom looks like when you live it out. And it's not so much um, you know, promising glory or anything else. It's just this is the right thing to do. The book of Proverbs is about this is the right thing to do. So many times we are so hung up on consequences. Um, one of the principles that I learned as a manager was, and I mean, Carol and I have talked about this often, that you should never not do the right thing because of a fear of what might happen. I actually, I, I had a case where I was working for a, company, uh, a ministry and had a woman working for me that two previous bosses had more than justified reason to fire her for cause. And they wouldn't do it because she was a minority she was a double minority. She was a racial minority and she was a woman. And yet, I, I had a huge blow up and I said, okay, I'm going to make it clear to you, if this ever happens again, you're gone. Well, that happened again. And I fired her. And everybody was saying, you can't fire her, she's a black woman. And I said, yes, I can. And they said, but she can sue us. And I went, well, if she does, we deal with it. Well, later on, somebody went back and changed her personnel record to say that she was that she had resigned. And she was fired for cause. It should have been fired for cause three times earlier. And so later on, somebody comes to me and says, um, there's this other ministry, and they're, and they're interviewing two candidates for development director. And one of them, you may know, and they mentioned her name. You know, oh, don't, don't, run away, run away. Okay. Because they had lied about it, because they were afraid of what might happen. Don't ever not do the right thing because of what might happen. Deal with the consequences. And so the principles, rather than the promises, the idea is do what is right, do what is good, do what is true. And then if there are consequences, you deal with them. That's what the book of Proverbs really is all about. Do the right thing. Marvin? Do this for myself. Dealing with people, there's a choice of bending so that they will like you, or standing straight and say, "This is it," <laughs> you know. And, and you have to be able to say, "I don't care if I'm liked. I want to do the right thing." Mm -hmm. And it's hard, right? And you try to do it with compassion. I mean, I gave chances, and have always wanted to manage people. But at a certain point, that's it. And you do the right thing. You do what is necessary. <laughs> Even if you even if you realize there may be hard consequences, you still do the right thing. You do what is good. Sometimes the consequences are worse by not. Yeah. Yeah. Long term, that's <laughs> right. If you, you recognize you get yourself into a position where you're compromising, you're compromising, you're struggling, you're struggling. Whereas if you're able to say no, this is how it is, and, and make the break, you're okay. Yeah. Hey, so <laughs> yeah, that's the principle. Really, the you know, if you wanted to sum up what Proverbs is all about, it's do the right thing. Do what is good, even if it's hard. Okay? When I was a teenager, I heard the, uh, a, a speaker give this question. He said, have you ever regretted doing what was right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you stop to think about it, yep. you just, you, you really can't. Yeah. Okay. Also, we see Proverbs as a real view of the real world. This is practical stuff. People are tempted to do stuff they shouldn't. People are tempted to lie. They're tempted to be lazy. 
you know, there's, all of this is very real. Well, there are consequences if you choose the wrong road on all that. Um, and, you know, when you talk about being lazy, the slugger, the ant, whatever, that doesn't mean you never rest. It doesn't mean you never relax. It doesn't mean you don't go on vacation or put your feet up. But if you do that too much, you know, um, then you're going to have a problem. This tells us to watch your tongue. Oh, yeah, Pam. Um, I find it amazing that they are constantly trying to teach youth, and yet anyone in this area knows that how many times uh, people have gone with folly uh, the older they get with the excuse of, well, you know, I made it this far, so I might as well just taste the well water over there. Or they come down here and suddenly become teenagers again. <laughs> or they just come down here every six months from Canada and decide to be a teenager. Yeah. Um, I just find it amazing that they're constantly teaching youth and yet they forget that uh, all of us, including women, um, that uh, there's no age on that. Yeah, we still have choices, you know, until we die. We still got to make choices for the right thing. I, I completely agree. I have, I don't know what mailing list I'm on, but over the last several weeks I have gotten several promotional emails from Ashley Madison. You know Ashley Madison? Yeah, yeah. Ashley Madison's a company, it's not a person. And they are a company that facilitates affairs. Oh. The tagline for the company is, life is short, have an affair. Oh my God. And their whole thing is, <laughs> if you have an affair, make sure you do it with another married person because then they've got as much motivation to keep it a secret as you are. That's their whole company. That's how they make their money. Oh, oh. my God. And so, I, I, again, I don't know what mailing list I'm on, but I'm getting these Ashley Madison things. And having a, life is short, have an affair. Do you really think there's no consequences to that? In terms of, I mean, even internal. You know, there's consequences to you as a person. Spiritually, emotionally, physically, you know, physically <laughs> um, to to all of those things, and yet, you know, and this is for people who are older, you know, people who tend to have affairs or middle-aged people, you know, um, and so the craziness of all of that. Yes, we all need to know this. We all need to learn this. You know, so I, I getting this from Carolyn and go, what possible mailing list could I be on that I keep popping up on there? Um, but yeah, it's. It's crazy. Well, we are all children in the eyes of God. Exactly. Well, we are not and we're all people. people. We're children. And we're mostly children in how we act. <laughs> <laughs> Quite often. It's true. Um, watch your tongue. You know, the danger of the tongue. The book of James gets into this a lot in the New Testament. But there's a lot here about watch what you say. You know, you can start fires of dissent and anger and grief and pain if you, if you don't watch what you say. Pay attention. This is a big one for me. You know, Carolyn will tell you, we talk about this all the time. Uh, the greatest failing of humanity is not paying attention. Because failure to pay attention is what causes most of our grief in relationships. Scripture says if we're just paying attention, there is evidence of God in, even in creation. Not paying attention is our biggest problem as human beings. And it, it amazes me. I mean, I'll be pushing a car down an aisle, and there'll be some... A, man or woman walking down the middle of the aisle, you know, looking off here, walk right into my car, right? <laughs> and I'll stop, because I don't know what direction they're going to go, they'll walk right into your car. And I'm thinking, how have you lived this long? <laughs> <laughs> and not stepped in front of a car. I mean, Divine people, intervention. <laughs> people don't pay attention in very practical ways, like they don't watch where they're going, but they also don't pay attention to what, what people around them need, or what the consequences of, of their words are, or the consequences of their actions are, or what they can do to help, or whatever. We simply don't pay attention, and that, I believe, is the greatest failing of all humanity, is we don't pay attention. It's a big bug to uh, It's about being generous. It's not all about you. In fact, you know, the, the book of Proverbs, if you could have several different sort of subheads for this book, but one of the subheads of the book of Proverbs would be, it's not all about you yeah. and what you want. There are values, there are truths, there are, there are uh, positives that are bigger than you. And one of those affects what do you do with the resources that have been entrusted to you. Because remember, it's all God's stuff. The question is, what does God want us to do with this stuff? He wants us to enjoy it, 
He does. But he also wants us to share it with people who have need. And if we fail to do that, then it will end up being a burden to us. So be generous. And keep your pants zipped. <laughs> there is a lot in this book about uh, adultery, about immorality, promiscuity, and that's, you know, that's a huge problem, and that's the one that takes people, especially young people, down that road. And, it, it, and there's, no, there's no light at the end of that tunnel. There's no positive way out of that. And again, part of the reason people don't <laughs> aren't generous, they don't keep their pants zipped, they don't watch their tongue, is because they're not paying attention. They're not really aware of the consequences of what they're doing because they're not looking at the obvious indications right in front of them. Okay. Um, yeah. Does it address it directly any homosexuality? No. Proverbs, as far as I know, it talks about uh, immorality and perverse things, is that it does use that expression. Um, but I don't think it specifically addresses that, not in the same way that, um, that other books do. I mean, uh, you can't look at the internet without states trying to approve gay marriages with everyone accepting people coming out. I mean, this whole thing is just going crazy. Um, and yet it's all being accepted. Yep. And that's, you know, there are... Um, History repeats itself. Yeah, and again, you're exactly right. History does repeat itself. I mean, there was there have been very there have been several periods of time down through history, including with the Roman Empire being the one we probably know most about, where morality had taken a turn very much in the kind of directions that morality has taken in, in the Western world in the last couple of decades, last several decades, um, and it all caved in on itself, and wiped it away, and they started all over again. So there is a cycle. Um, Acceptance of immoral behavior, and then a you know, recognition of the damaging aspect of that, um, and not just homosexuality, but other you know other sexual expression, you know the, the sexual revolution in uh, in our own time in the 20th century, and the only thing that really stemmed that was the rise of disease, I think, um, and so people got scared of it. Uh, but yeah, that's. We see it come, you know, there, there is a cycle up and down in terms of that. And we will reach a point as a culture, one way or the other, where we recognize the extent to which that is so damaging to us that we have to start changing it. Ken? Yeah, I mean, you, you look at what's taking place in our culture, how we are conditioning everybody to be a certain way, and then when we see people go that way, you know, that everything sexual is fine, and didn't they deviate and they turn around and throw them in prison for being exactly what they're trying to create them to be? <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, when it's, and so it's, uh, it's, it's a dead end street. Yeah. Um, and the challenge there, <clears throat> I'll use the example of our church. Um, we have a large gay and lesbian community in Lakeside, obviously, and I have said that I would like nothing better than to have significant number of gay and lesbian people in our church because we are all sinners we all uh, are in need of both the grace and the healing that is provided by jesus and so people they would be welcome the place where i draw the line is when the question came up and this is true for anybody who is who is in, in living any kind of lifestyle that is contrary to scripture um, the, the place I would draw the line is for any positional leadership. Again, we want people to come. We want them to hear the gospel. We want them to hear the grace of Jesus Christ because that's what changes hearts. That's what changes people's lives. That's what changed my life. That's what changed your all's lives. And so we can't reject people <coughs> because of their sinfulness because we're all sinful. And we all need Jesus but exactly because of that. Um, I've told the story many times about Carolyn and I being in line to go to the Indigo Girls concert. And I did not know until that night that the Indigo Girls were both lesbians. But the line was 80% was young women, many of them holding hands or public displays of affection. And so we sort of got the idea. Well, a group of cars show up, and people start piling out of these cars, and they've got signs that say, God hates fags, and homosexuals will burn forever. And, you know, and I'm thinking, do you really think you're helping? Do you think anybody is going to want to turn from whatever their lifestyle is because of people like that? Because of you talking to them like that? 
That's the worst possible thing you can do. Um, you know, we we talk about what we're in our church. We talk about what we're for. We want to draw people to the grace of Jesus Christ. Now there are limits, as I say. It's anyone. If somebody were working selling pirated DVDs and they wanted to become a leader in our church, I go, no, you can't. Not unless you stop doing that. Um, we've had cases where uh, had a young man wanted to be involved in leadership leading worship, and it turned out he was living with a woman that wasn't his wife. She was married to somebody else. And this was when Arturo was still with us, and he and I went and talked to him and said, look, we love you, we, we love your wife, because that's what he called her, and your kids, but I cannot let you, we cannot let you be in leadership as long as that's your situation. And so whatever it is that's contrary to the Word of God, there's a barrier that, that would not allow somebody to be in the leadership because of that. But that doesn't mean we reject them as people or we don't want them to be part of you know, the church, the fellowship of the church, because how else are they going to hear the truth, right? And so we as Christians have to be careful because it's, it's easy. There are two, almost everybody goes one of two very easy ways. Either they say, well, God made them that way, and so it's okay. And the parts of Scripture that very plainly say it's not okay, well, we don't accept that. <laughs> that's old. That's easy. That's very easy. Because that's what the world wants us to say. On the other hand, there are some who say homosexuals are going to burn forever. They're all going to hell. And leave it at that. With no sense of compassion, no sense of, of, of anything positive. And I, um, that's easy, too. But that's not, I don't believe that's what Jesus would have said. The hard way, the narrow way, is to say we believe the Word of God is the Word of God, we believe everything in it, we believe what it says about lifestyle choices, including that one, homosexual choice. And yet, Jesus calls, especially calls the most broken to himself. And our job is to be the body of Christ and to call those people to fellowship and to call those people to reconciliation and to healing. Not reject them but not accept their actions either. But like I say, the same thing is true with heterosexual who are involved in that kind of relationship, or who, you know, if somebody was advertising in the newspaper, I can help you cheat on your taxes, then that person would not, as far as I'm concerned, be eligible for, for any leadership role in the church. And I would probably talk with them about that, okay? But, again, the hard way is to call people to fellowship with Jesus that they might know him and be healed by him and saved by him, well, also not saying it's okay, like the culture wants us to. All right? Well, just like gay marriage now, it's such a big deal for them to be married. Unfortunately, because the government has tied so many other things to marriage and so many rights and privileges that yeah, only married people can have, so then they want to, to be married. Just like if we have that barrier that you can be a member and you can be in good standing, but you can't be in a position of authority or leadership, I will be challenged. You yeah. know, there will be those that are able well, and successful, and they'll say, I, you know, you can't do that. <laughs> even membership. I mean, yeah. I, I, there'd be some very serious conversations about membership if somebody were like that. Yeah. It, it, what I say like that. Like in any, again, right. in any lifestyle choice, not just homosexuality, heterosexuality, business, money, but whatever it is that is contrary to scripture before membership, I would, you know, we'd have to deal with it very seriously. Um, but still, we invite them to come. Well, first, can, yeah, first candidate. Uh, I, I heard Don Finto, he was the pastor of Belmont Church. One time he was witnessing to a woman who was a stripper and talking about Jesus. And she turned to him and said, If I become a stripper, am I going to have to give up stripping? And I become he, a Christian. Or if I become a Christian. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, if I become a Christian, I'm going to have to give up stripping. And he said, honey, if you take Jesus into your life, I will trust him to tell you who to take your clothes off for and who to put them on for. Yeah. And, you know, but by doing that, he showed her the love, but yet, you know, also put back on her the responsibility that you seek Jesus, and I'm sure he can... He there can are consequences, him. yeah. Yeah. You know, Martin Luther, I've quoted often, uh, Martin Luther said, love God and do as you please. Which means if you truly love God, if you truly are in love with God, and, and He is your Lord and Savior and ruler of your life, then what you please will be pleasing to Him. If it's not, then you need to back up and ask Him if you've got the first question wrong. Uh, what I wanted to say, it just sort of follows right along 
just put a comma there and keep going. I once belonged to um, a particular church congregation who was a downtown church, and we had a lot of homeless people in the area who had been shoved out the doors of mental health facilities. And lots of times they were in mental health facilities because of their homosexuality and their outward behavior and where it led, led them in the days before people were coming out. And um, it was amazing the numbers who came to our church because we valued them as people. We accepted their humanity and their ability to um, work within the church parameters of um, respecting, caring, and loving their community and their fellow men. And that congregation changed, I would say, 95%, partly due to this location, but uh, demographics. Mm -hmm. um, and the ministry of that church became very outgoing uh, with street ministries, uh, parish ministries, and all these things. And they administered to those homeless people, and they were most often the um, gay people who had been robbed of so much quality to their life. And they um, witnessed outwardly uh, about the uh, acceptance of God and Jesus accepted them, even with this frailty they had, this, you know, they acknowledged. Well, the challenge always is to, uh, and, and there's a, a book called um, Welcoming But Not Affirming by Alistair McGrath, which is a beautiful way of saying it. We welcome all people. All people need to come to Jesus, but we cannot affirm certain lifestyle choices, homosexuality being one of them. That we don't keep people out, we don't prevent people, you know, because otherwise, how are they going to hear the truth? Right? Jesus went to the people who were the rejects of their day. That doesn't mean we say it's okay. I mean, I, I read this book, I read the first part of Romans, I read other sections, and not just the Old Testament. It's not just the Old Testament stuff, and it says plainly that that lifestyle is not is not honoring God. It is not what God wants, and we will not we will not uh, soften that. You know, we will not negate that. But we will welcome, even though we don't affirm those lifestyle choices, um, and, and that's that's where we stand. It's, it's if I you know, yes, my 215 years ago, the, the Episcopal Church that I was raised up in, uh, they had a major schism caused by the Bishop of New Hampshire being practicing gay, who was appointed as, as uh, Bishop Keith Robinson, and he uh, apparently had a homosexual lover. Continuing that relationship, yeah, yeah, partner, yeah, yeah. and and that 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 created major schism in the Episcopal Church, and like lots of churches pulled away from the Episcopal the American Episcopal Church for that reason. Yeah, well, uh, in fact, John and Susan Yates, um, people that we know, we were on the, the second, the first century cruises with when we visited the churches of Revelation in, in Turkey and whatnot. Um, they their church, Falls Falls Creek. Episcopal Church in Falls Creek, Virginia is one of the oldest churches in America. It was the church that George Washington went to. It existed before there was an Episcopal diocese. And yet, because of this issue, and the, the ordination of uh, not only homosexual priests, but also uh, homosexual bishop in Gene Robinson, and the intention to do that, do more of that, um, they voted to leave the Episcopal Church. Well, again, that church had existed since before the Episcopal Diocese had existed, and yet the courts decided that the Episcopal Church owns that building, and and the, the parsonage, and all of the choir robes, and all of the books, and over $2 million that were in a bank account. And the $2 million had been given by parishioners after the initial problem had started with the specific designation that it was not to be used by the diocese, it was only to be used by that specific church, and yet... You know, we look at something like that and we go, how is that fair? The church has been there. The, the church was not built by the Episcopal Church, the Episcopal Diocese. It was not, you know, they supported the diocese, not the other way around. And yet the courts decided, you don't own this church anymore. You don't own anything. You have nothing anymore. And so they were meeting, they were meeting the Baptist Church. The Baptist Church often will let them start meeting in their facilities. Now they're still growing. And, and spiritually they're doing very, very well. But John and Susan are, uh, are real saints.
in dealing with all of that. And so, yeah, we are very broken and very blind to the culture. Um, and in fact, to give you an idea, the bishop of that, the Episcopal bishop of that area is a woman. And she was quoted in the media as saying, after this dispute came up, and again, I know the people that are involved in the dispute, they're not angry, they're not malicious, they're not vindictive, they're very gentle people who said, we just can't be part of this denomination anymore. But the Episcopal bishop said, I would rather have a brothel in that building than let them continue to use it. Oh, oh my. She was quoted in the media saying that. So, okay. I'm done for the day. Ending on that high note. <laughs> so, uh, yes, Ken? One more verse. Uh, I think when we look at everything in our relationship with God, and really when we come to a point where it really changes our life, I think Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 best expresses what that true faith is when it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your, under on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make your path straight. And when you put your trust in God in that way, that's the point that your life really changes. Yeah. And I think that that just exemplifies what it means to be saved. Right. Truly love God, and then do as you please. <laughs>